great talks about like cutting edge technology and like beautiful, elegant technical solutions. Just to be clear, this is not one of them. This talk is about the darkness that <laughs> lives inside technology. Um, even before I worked for USDS, I was always a, one of those engineers that was just really attracted to like old, complicated, legacy technology. So um, prior to USDS, I ran my own moderately successful data consulting company that focused mainly on infrastructure. I did some work for the city of New York. I did some work for the major publishing houses. I did some work for the UN. And so I sort of became the person that got called when a database was in trouble and they didn't know what to do or how to fix it. And generally, these engagements started something like this. We're having performance issues. Can you look at our database and tell us what to do about it? And I would usually respond to this by, yeah, sure. Can you start off by sending me kind of like what your data models are? So maybe some sort of visualization, maybe a Visio. Let's see what this looks like. And usually what I get back when I make that request is something that looks like this. So what is your first response to this image? Like how many of you are just like, oh my god, kill it with fire. Kill it with fire right now. And how many are like, this is totally normal. I have a database that looks just like this at home. All right, excellent, this is the right crowd. <laughs> so when most people react to that kind of image, they're reacting to the, like, the size of it, the number of tables. And the problem with uh, these kind of databases is not really the number of tables. Databases can run very effectively and efficiently with hundreds of tables or even thousands of tables. It's why you have so many tables. So essentially what I want to talk to you guys about today is the idea of technical debt in databases. We tend to think of technical debt as being something that's specific to application code, but that's not because it doesn't exist in databases. That's just because technical debt is a product of change, and we change our application code much more often than we change our database schemas, our data models, or our infrastructure. Probably the best explanation of technical debt that I ever received was from this online group called Legacy Code Rocks, which is full of engineers just like me that are like, gimme, gimme, gimme when it comes to legacy code. And they explained it this way, that whenever you launch a new feature, it's like you've had a house party. And whenever you do refactoring, it's like you're cleaning up after the house party. Now, you can have a house party and not clean up the next day, and it's not the end of the world. But the more parties you have in your house before you've cleaned up, the worse condition your house is going to be at the end of uh, the week. So that's the way I like to think about technical debt in general. But another useful distinction is to kind of uh, really clearly define the difference between legacy itself and technical debt. Because there is some overlap, especially in the amount of money that they cost organizations throughout the, the life cycle of the organization. But they're actually two different things. Um, so for example, with legacy code, what you see is really clear and concise and consistent design patterns that simply do not match the current fashion for resource optimization. So what I mean by that is if you take something like a, a client, should your client be a fat client or should it be a skinny client? Throughout like, the history of computer science, the best practices and the answer to that question has changed over time. And generally, what has caused it to change has been more economics rather than technical uh, best practice. Uh, storage becomes cheaper than it once was. Personal computers become cheaper and more feasible than they once were. The internet gets faster. These things cause those best practices to shift in one way or the other. So with legacy code, you have essentially the design patterns of another era still trying to run when you can optimize a system much more effectively under a different pattern. With uh, technical debt, you generally have multiple design patterns kind of piled on top of one another. You have like partial migrations. So you end up with a lot of like what am I looking at sort of moments where you can't really tell exactly what the intention was behind the way the technology is structured. Another big difference between technical debt and legacy is the effect that the underlying software and hardware and upgrades has on performance. With most legacy environments, when you upgrade the hardware, you upgrade uh, the software, for example, the OS, you see a boost in performance. With technical debt, your, your performance is a problem with the actual efficiency of the code and the environment itself. So you don't see the boost in performance from doing those kind of upgrades that you would expect. Uh, and most of the time with databases, when I come into a project, the first thing that they have tried is upgraded the version of the database to make it run faster. And then they're very disappointed that they have not seen it running significantly faster because they upgraded to a new version. 
The last thing that's important to kind of understand is the difference between technical debt and legacy is that in both of these situations, it's very difficult to bring new engineers into the team, but it's difficult for different reasons. With legacy, you're dealing with a skills gap. You may be dealing with a COBOL mainframe and your new grads are not coming out of school knowing how to do COBOL. Um, that's a problem. With technical debt, you're dealing with candidates that have the skill set and the expertise on the infrastructure that you're running, but they simply cannot understand how the infrastructure is configured, how the data models work. We had a, a project two years ago where um, they, one of the things they wanted to do was migrate from Oracle Advanced Replication to Golden Gate. Uh, Oracle was um, deprecating. Uh, advanced replication. So they called up Oracle and Oracle, Oracle was like, no problem, we'll send out one of our consultants. This guy is a DBA, he's an expert in Oracle. It took him over a year to go through all of their data models and make sense of what their data warehouses were doing and how everything interacted and come up with a plan of how they can migrate their data. So when you have a situation of technical debt, you can have the most brilliant experts in the world and it's still gonna take them a really long time to onboard onto your system. Um, so, one of the important things about technical debt is if you do not have a way to measure your technical debt, you will always procrastinate and put off paying it down to another day, and then it will just get worse over time. But measuring tech, uh oh. Oh, okay, I have a slide it doesn't like to show. All right, anyway, moving on. Um, measuring technical debt is actually a legitimately difficult problem. There's a hilarious cartoon on this slide that you would be laughing at now if you could see it, but you're just gonna have to wait until I put the slides on speaker deck now to see the hilarious cartoon. Um, one of my favorite ways of measuring technical debt is to track the time between when you start a feature and when this feature is deployed to production. And look at how much of that time is actually spent doing regression testing, doing bug fixes, and then look at how that time increases or, or decreases over time. And then when, as you're seeing increases, now you know like, okay, we've got a technical debt problem here. We maybe need to come in and clean our house a little bit. There are some other ways of measuring technical debt. You can look at the increase in operation costs. You can use static code analysis tools. Um, some people like to do it test coverage. But most of these things focus on application code. They're not really suitable for looking at technical debt in the database because we don't really talk about technical debt in the database. And one of the main reasons why we don't talk about technical debt in the database is because most businesses don't make it past 10 years. They either go out of business, they get acquired, or they merge with another company. And when they do something like that, when they have that kind of life-changing event in the company, generally their data and their databases do not stay the same. Somebody's databases get shut down, somebody's databases get migrated over to a different system. Um, the other reason why we don't generally talk about technical debt in the database is that we have kind of a responsibility gap between the various people who touch our data infrastructure and what their, what their roles are. So we've been talking a lot in this conference about the gap between the analyst, the data scientist, and the data engineer, and who has responsibilities where. And if you, if you were in this room for the talk right before lunch, there was actually a whole conversation about can we move those responsibilities over so that the analysts are taking on more of some of the engineering responsibilities, and what are the pros and cons of doing that? But there, even within the engineering community, there are little silos where we have responsibility gaps. So how many of you work for a company where you have DBAs? All right, cool. How many of you feel like you can explain the difference between a data engineer and a DBA? We have, I think, two hands go up. And one of the things that I did when I was starting to work on this talk is I actually just asked a whole bunch of engineering friends. I was like, what, how would you define the difference between a DBA and a data engineer? And I got a whole set of really, really interesting, somewhat bizarre answers about what the difference between those two things are. There are some people that think that data engineer is simply a synonym. It is the new buzzword for DBA. And there are people who think that data engineer is like an architect who's doing the whole landscape, while his DBA is just focused on one particular type of database. But not being clear about what these roles actually are and which ones you need mean that you have a question about whose responsibility is it to clean up the technical debt in the first place? Who optimizes the queries? Who normalizes the database? 
who does backups and software upgrades, like how do we determine where these tasks are? So let's go back to this. And let's zoom in a little bit and simplify this a little. Uh, all right, okay. <laughs> this is a thing now. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna hope the rest of these slides work because otherwise it's gonna be a very interesting talk. Um, we're gonna look at elements of this database specifically and why there are components of technical debt and why there are problems. So, okay, good, we have a working slide. The, the, first, thing, the first thing that we wanna look at here is that we have column and table names that are not particularly intuitive. I don't, I don't know, does anyone have any guesses about what those, those, those names actually stand for? No, I mean, it's hard. One of the, uh, just to be clear, like, I made this stuff up because I find that clients get really persnickety when you start like broadcasting their data models on like live talks. But um, this is actually indicative of like thing, things that I see in the wild. Uh, table names that are based on um, uh, these really bizarre naming conventions where it's hard to actually understand what you're looking at. And sometimes the Rationale behind the naming convention changes, but the naming convention itself does not change. So for example, I had one project where they decided to name all of their databases after the data center that it was in, and then they shut down one of their data, better, data centers and moved it to another data center and did not change the naming convention at all. So I just had to remember these random facts about the history of their company in order to figure out what I was looking at when I was looking at a, a, a database. So what else is going on in this database? We have something that looks like a primary key that is actually a social security number. So we have personal identifying information as a primary key. And this is one of a, the big things that you see first on a database with lots of technical debt is uh, improper privacy and security handling. So we actually had a, a database where we had that problem. They were using social security numbers as primary keys. And first of all, I actually think that is illegal. So it's that pro there's that problem. But um, beyond the legality of using social security numbers as an ID, um, we wanted to give them a, uh, a significantly powerful performance testing environment. And they had about four terabytes of data in this database. But it was an, also an Oracle database. And one of the neat things that Oracle does is they will optimize queries, um, not just, they will optimize things not just by the size of data, but also the distribution of data. So you want to make sure that you're not just dumping four terabytes of nonsense into your test database, but four terabytes of nonsense that actually accurately reflects the structure of the production data. And Oracle has tools that will help you do that, but it's very hard to use them when you have your primary keys or social security numbers and you can't put that in your test database and all of that. Um, some other things that people do that fit in this category is um, they give temporary roles, they create temporary user roles because they have application developers that don't exactly know what they need permissions to, so they just give it a, a temporary role that has too much too much access, too, much, too many permissions, and then never get rid of it. So it's just sitting in the database waiting for a, a, an attacker to find it. Um, they may not be timely in upgrading their hashing algorithms. Just in my professional career, we've gone from, yeah, plain text is fine. Just you know, make sure your database is secure. No one will ever find those passwords to encrypt it but don't encrypt it with MD5 to now don't encrypt it with SHA-1 either. Like these kind of migrations are things that people sometimes put off far too long. Um, so you'll see that in databases that have lots of technical debt as well. The last thing is that um, when people get started with building a particular architecture, particularly startups, they don't want to necessarily invest in all of the large scale cutting edge tools. So they, they, they go for a well, for right now, we're gonna do our message queue functionality in the database. We know we're not supposed to, but we don't wanna set up like a rabbit MQ and cluster and all of that. We'll just do it in the database. And that's fine until they have grown to the point and they've matured as an organization where they actually now do need that architecture and they've never migrated off of it. So, Let's see, what else? Um, we notice in this uh, diagram that we actually have a lot of views. We have some tables that are in the lighter colors and a lot of views that are in the darker colors. 
And database views are kind of fun things. They can be super useful, but they can also hide a lot of uh, dysfunctionality within the database. So the ways they're useful is that if you are regularly joining multiple tables, a view is super, super useful for that. It's essentially a stored query. It makes it much nicer and neater and easier to query the database. Um, if you're doing, they're particularly useful if you have a table and you want to give a little bit more access control and subset the data so only certain users can access only certain parts of the table. Um, you can do them for routine data calculations like sums or uh, geocoding. And they're really useful when you're doing feature flagging or you want to gradually roll something out across multiple applications. You kind of create views for each application and you change the views one at a time. And so, so the underlying functionality of the other applications is not affected. But on the other side of things, views can help reinforce developer silos. I've definitely seen engineering organizations where they get into the pattern of, I have my views, and you have your views, and now I don't have to talk to you about our schema or about what data we need or about anything like that because we will just have our separate views. And so that can create a lot of problems. Um, it hides complexity. And it can push application logic into the database, which I'll get into more detail a little bit later on, but generally causes a whole bunch of different problems. And one of the things that advocates of views will generally say about them is that you're not duplicating the data. You're not restoring the data. So they're small and they're light and they're super easy. And it's true, they're small, but they're not inconsequential. And if you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of views, it starts to add up over time and just increase the size of your database. Another thing we have in this database is we have DB links to other databases. So those of you who are, are not familiar with the magic of DB links, it essentially allows you to do a join across databases. If I query this table and it accesses another database and pulls data from that, that table as well and returns both. Um, I mean, obviously, now you're dealing with your response time has both your query time and also your network speed bundled into it. You're also dealing with issues of directionality. You've now linked these two databases and these two tables together, and you'll get different performance depending on which table you query. Um, it complicates security in a number of different ways. You have to make sure that your user permissions are in sync. Otherwise, you are essentially giving somebody access to another database who maybe should not have access to that database. And it sort of begs the question of why was the data separated into two databases in the first place? Sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes you legitimately do not own the other data set, but it creates a lot of like, interesting complications when you're looking at performance of an old database. Another thing that's sometimes in a similar vein is the concept of stored procedures, sometimes called trigger functions, depending on which variant uh, of database you prefer. Um, they are essentially scripts that are inserted into the database and run on the database itself. Um, advocates of stored procedures will very quickly tell you that the code runs much faster in the database than it would ever run in the application, which is 100% true. But um, it, you're pulling application logic and putting it in a place where your application developers cannot see it, right? So. There's behavior going on behind the scenes that is hidden from most of your engineers. And one of the things that I, I find is pretty common when people are heavily using storage procedures is they're also not putting them into version control. So they're, they're taking the, the attitude that, well, we're backing up the database, and the database backup will have the stored procedure in it, so we don't really need to put this in version control. And that sounds great until you have an incident like we had a year ago where someone accidentally wiped the database and none of their backups worked and we had people digging through emails from like three years looking for the stored procedures that were supposed to be installed on this database. It just creates like a whole bunch of chaos when it goes really, really wrong. Um, because the stored procedures themselves tend to be hidden from the eyes of your engineering team, it can be harder to trace or predict the impact of changes to the database when you use them. And the last thing that I want to point out in this mythical database of ours is that we have some blob column types. For those of you who don't remember or aren't familiar with the term, blob stands for binary large object. Um, they're usually images, audio, um, sometimes executables in um, the database, essentially things that are not data and not queryable generally. Um, 
they became popular when storage became cheap, particularly in about the 90s, when um, network connections were relatively slow, because you could just like put, say for example, the user's picture, or the avatar in the database with their profile, and then, then away you go. You don't have to worry about making another query. But nowadays, connection speeds are much, much faster, and so we prefer to take this like giant chunk of space and not store it in the database, but put it in an object store like S3 or something like that. So when you find a database like this, what do you do? Like, how do you approach these kind of problems in, in the database? Do you start by auditing the queries? Do you migrate the whole thing to a NoSQL solution? Um, do you rewrite and simplify the applications that are using the database? Or do you just light the thing on fire and go home and just like abandon all hope? What do you guys think? Like, how many of you would auto the queries? What was your first out? Okay. Who would migrate to NoSQL or something fancy? Okay. Uh, who would rewrite and simplify the applications using the database? And who would light the whole thing on fire and go home? <laughs> there are far too many hands up in that than I want here. So the approach that I use is that they didn't get to this place all in one day. So they're not going to get out of it all in one day either. And um, we, we advocate a strategy of incremental improvement. And the first thing that I like to look at when we're troubleshooting a database like this are actually the non-technical aspects of it. Going back to this idea of the responsibility gap. Do we have DBAs in this organization? Do we have data engineers? What other kinds of engineers do we have? Do we have a traditional ops team or more of an SRE DevOps team? Like, what are, who are the players in the, the technical uh, uh, landscape of this organization? And what are their responsibilities? And how do those responsibilities break down? How many of you would describe yourself as working for a tech company? Most of the hands. OK. So tech companies are great, because they're full of engineers. And it makes all engineering decisions way easier. But there are lots and lots and lots of organizations that do really important technical work that are actually not tech companies, like hospitals and schools and the federal government, right? And those are organizations where engineers are not always the first class citizens of the organization, which means that they have leadership who are not technical, who are making technical decisions and just sort of passing them down the chain of command. Um, I, I've had this happen uh, quite a number of times. And actually, when I was working at the UN, one of the big things that I did was liaisoning with the leadership of my project to explain to them exactly what the little changes they wanted really meant from a technical point of view. I find the things that create the most debt are generally described as just little changes, small features, like just super, super, super simple. And they can appear that way because sometimes their design assets are really super small. But sometimes your, your, your non-technical leadership doesn't appreciate exactly what it takes to do that right and what the value of doing it right is. So when you consider these things in the project that you're working on, the best way to solve them is by improving the communication tools that are available to your team. Um, organized chat, like Slack, can be really helpful because it allows everybody to see everybody else and figure out who's who in the organization and message them really quickly. Um, automation is actually remarkably useful when you're dealing with these sort of situations. I would say that probably about 70% of the time when I come in to fix a database, I spend most of my time fixing their DevOps pipelines rather than their database. Because when you start getting people to automate things, particularly like the deployment and configuration of database instances, now they have to take all those stored procedures out of the database and put them in some kind of uh, configuration file that is stored in some sort of repository that makes it visible to other people on the engineering team. So, Getting them to start doing more automation can be a big help here. And documentation. Of course, documentation is always a really useful thing to have when you're, you're tackling technical debt. Um, are they using ORM? Um, if they are, then there's, there, they can just comment it like they would normal code. If they're not, there are ways of commenting uh, tables that uh, don't require that. So these are important things to start to consider. The first part is really about like the non-technical aspects of what's going on. How did we get here? 
And then once you've gotten that down, um, I think you have to very clearly define a goal because when you have a database that's really struggling, it's generally struggling on a lot of different fronts at once, but you can't fight a battle on multiple fronts, so you gotta pick which one is most important. Performance, security, accuracy, these are all things that might be on the table. You gotta figure out which is the best place to, to make the most gains. And then I would say that you prioritize based on the worst queries, although I want to qualify what I mean by worst query. Um, it, I, it's very easy to look at a readout like this and just kind of go, well, okay, this query takes 88 seconds to return. That's pretty awful. Obviously, that is the worst query. And to totally overlook the fact that that query only runs 13 times a day, whereas the one directly below it takes about six seconds to return but runs close to 7,000 times a day. So it's very very important to clearly decide what you mean by worst query. It will vary based on what the database is doing and the queries in question, but it's not always obvious. Once you've got that down, the next thing to do is to sort of try to minimize the vectors. And what I mean by that is when you make a change to your database, what are the ripple effects and how can we control and minimize the ripple effects with that change? So. One thing might be to migrate application logic out of the stored procedures and into the application. Maybe that helps. Another thing might be to use database views to kind of gradually roll out changes and keep certain applications on the old model while other applications are using the new model. Lastly, I would say that anytime you can reduce the overall size of the database, you can dramatically improve its performance. So another thing that I like to look at is like why are they storing the data that they're storing and do they have to still be storing the data that they're storing? Because generally when we're talking about these kind of databases, we're talking about really old databases. Databases that have been running for 20, 30, sometimes longer. I think the oldest system I've looked at was uh, built in 1968, so do the math there. Like that's a lot of data. Are they still storing all the data they collected in day one and do they have to be storing all the data that they collected in day one? And if they don't, then getting them on a reasonable archival strategy about like when they start to archive data and how much of their current data they can archive makes a big difference. So now you're probably thinking like, okay, this is all nice and, and very interesting, but I'm never gonna work for a company or an organization that has problems like this because that's not my thing. I'm never gonna have to deal with this. Why should I care? And the first reason why you should care is because when a database has been online for longer than 10 years, it's generally because the data is super important. Like these are some of the examples of systems that I've worked on. They're like critical for national security, people's pensions, like just making sure that uh, money goes where it's supposed to and the democracy functions the way we need it to. So the kind of databases that are generally in the most trouble are also the most valuable ones and the work fixing them and optimizing them is incredibly meaningful. Second thing you might wanna consider is that like lately, I've been going to a lot of DevOps and SRE conferences and there's been a lot of talk about being on call and I hear some variation of this quite a lot where like no matter how much experience or how brilliant people are, they are terrified, absolutely terrified of being on call because they might get called when everything is on fire and then they don't know what to do and like they'll have a massive meltdown and everyone will know that they're unqualified to do their job. And the reality of it is that when you've worked on really, really old, brittle systems, the quirks and idiosyncrasies of the smooth, modern uh, uh, system seem less intimidating than when you have a, okay. This is just not my, not my day. Okay, cool. <sighs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what this says about, about my face. But anyway. <laughs> Um, when you work on, on systems that are super old, like uh, the, the experience of being a software engineer in a more modern system becomes much less intimidating because you've sort of come to the darkness and seen the worst that technology has to offer and lived to tell the tale about it. The last thing that I will leave you with as to why you should like explore working on these kind of old systems is totally, completely selfish in nature. The way we judge expertise of engineers generally falls upon their obscure fact 
quotient and like their war stories. And when you work at like normal companies that have like very nice orderly technology, you're very limited in your war story um, potent. I like definitely working at USDS did boost my uh, my hireability rather considerably just from the crazy uh, stories I could tell people during like software interviews about this one time where we had uh, a, com a computer that was storing environmental uh, environmental uh, variables in the Windows registry, and we had to first find the computer and then convince the person who owned the computer to let us open up the registry and kind of like futz around with it so that we could figure out what the environmental variables were. I mean, like that's a legitimately fun story. Um, so thank you so much for your time. I think we have a little bit of time left for questions. Oh, no questions. Wait. There is a mic coming. Don't worry. What's the worst database you ever worked with? <laughs> I'm, I am not going to tell you by name, but I will describe it. It may not be fair to say the worst. I'm the most fascinated by it. We had a system that was very old. Um, that was running on uh, a mainframe from the 60s, and they had actually put modern mainframes in front of it as kind of like a cache. So, like, because ultimately this whole thing was backing a web application, which was the most bizarre thing in the world to me, because I was like, you got a web app, that, and you trace the data flow all the way down that's harvesting data from a mainframe. And I was like, this is crazy. But they built like this whole elaborate chain of mainframes to like protect the mainframe that was like just 50 years old. So uh, that, that's pretty high up on my list for sure. Over there. Uh, you've talked about incremental change. Have you ever done incremental change from like a terrible, terrible data source from a database that's like 20 years old into like a modern cloud equivalent, like hosted shininess and like seen that whole process through and how long did it take? Yeah, actually I have. I would not say that it's all the way to the shiny part yet because uh, the, the database that I'm thinking of, we work, started working on about uh, a little over two years ago. Uh, and so it takes a long time. Like this is like, probably close to 20 years of incremental decay. Um, but uh, I got to the point with them where I felt very comfortable with what the engineers were doing. And more to the point, I felt like the senior level leadership was listening to the engineers and knew who had the right ideas and who to empower. And so like all of that was working very, very well. And so I rolled off to go respond to something else and came back like six months later. And they had, um, they originally had a database that was just full of these blobs. Like, and the blobs themselves were pretty small, but there were like millions of them. And so it had gotten so bad that they no longer could back up their databases because that's how large this database was. Um, and so we looked at it and we said, you know, you need to like put this on something else, like a file system of some kind, like S3. And at the time that we came in and we told them that, everybody was like, that's impossible. We'll never be able to do that. When I came back seven months later, they were about 20% into that migration. And they'd done it on their own, which made me really super excited, like that we didn't have to be there like holding their hand and pushing them. We just had to get some stuff out of the way for them. And then they kind of like decided, hey, let's do this cool thing. And then went on their own and started doing it. I, um so I had a question about, uh, one of the things that I've read about uh, that I really like about USDS is that it has a lot of advocacy for open source software. Uh, so could you speak a little bit to the interaction between OSS and uh, legacy systems and whether you think that open source software is a, some kind of solution to the problems that we have with legacy systems? Sure, so I would say that it, it's a, it's a good option. I prefer 
not to think of technical solutions as open source versus closed source. I prefer to think of technical solutions as how well do they fit the technical requirements that we have. And fortunately, many of those things are in fact open source nowadays, but we have had situations where the, I think the, the best product for our need was a closed source product. So for example, there was a static code analysis tool named CAST that I believe is closed source. And we looked at it, we're like, well, it'd be really cool if we could do this open source, but this is actually like exactly what we need for this particular use case. So uh, I, I would say yes in general, but I don't necessarily make that a qualifying factor when I'm looking at technical solutions. Um, I had a question kind of going back to what one of your answers, like the previous one of like, getting senior leadership buy-off, and I know that was a really important part of the USDS mission. Mm. Um, and um, do you have any advice for how do you deal with that in, in a private company where getting senior leadership to buy off and acknowledge that you need to migrate to new systems and really not necessarily say like embrace the cloud, but like get rid of the Microsoft SQL servers that are like under people's desks and, you know, move away from fixed files, from like Nielsen files from the 80s. Yeah. Like how do you get the buy-in? <laughs> um, so I would say two things. One, persistence. Um, and two, also understanding your own value. Like there are situations where you can lead a horse to water when you can't make them drink. So if you understand your own value and always what your options are in a given situation, then that actually empowers you to, I think, be more respectful in your advocacy. So I, I will say that when I started working at the UN, um, I, one of the things that senior leadership used to say a lot is they go, well, when the software is done, da 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 And I would always respond to that, the software is never done. <laughs> and then I would explain to them that like software is a living thing and it has to be uh, upgraded and adjusted as needs are adjusted. And so you're never going to get to the point where the website is built, the software is done, now we can go focus on other things. And it took me, I think, probably about a year to get to the point where that had internalized and they understood it and they stopped saying like when the software is done. But it, we did eventually get there with them.